What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Data Dash, and today is November 29th of 2017. Well folks, today I want to do a little bit of an educational video. Uh, you know, we are living in some crazy times for Bitcoin, and I know many of you out there are, you know, some of you are FOMOing into Bitcoin, you have a fear of missing out into the market, and some of you are fighting, you have fear, uncertainty, and doubt at these highs, and everyone's panicking one way or the other, and it's all crazy, and Look guys, I'm not here today to even really solely talk about Bitcoin. I'm here to give you a little bit of a history lesson to help you kind of understand what's been going on with the price action of Bitcoin. So a lot of people have noticed these kind of rapid run-ups in Bitcoin and we've, we've gotten past the $10,000 level and it's continuing to go to higher levels. We actually saw a run-up actually just uh, within the past few hours all the way up to around the $11,500 range. This is pretty incredible to know that it's gone up another $1,500 within just a matter of practically a day, less than a day actually. So because of this, uh, many people are thinking, wow, this is crazy. I better get into Bitcoin. And then also you have some people who are, are panicking at the fact that literally within about a 10 to 15 minute period, depending on what exchange you were looking at, we saw practically anywhere from an out, around an $800 to a $1,000 drop in the market. And, you know, as much as we are up for the past years, that's why I'm not trying to FUD here. Uh, I guess the, the chart here is not working very well on, uh, on GDAX. There's been a lot of server issues. But if we go over here to the 30 minute here, to be fair, on, uh, on any exchange, we are well above previous prices uh, than we were you know, back a few hours ago. So I'm not here to fight. However, this is a pretty rapid price drop as well as what we saw over here. And a lot of people are, are curious, it's like, you know, this is good to see all this positive price action, but if it can be lost in such a matter of minutes, you know, is this stable price action? What's really going on here? And these are good questions to start asking if you want to understand markets. And I'm going to teach you all um, what I can today or share some knowledge with you all today of why this is happening to uh, such a frequent degree here in Bitcoin markets more than, um, more than anything. But I'm going to use, as I do with a lot of my lessons, experiences and knowledge of traditional stock markets. You know, a lot of people at the end of the day continue to argue with me and I understand Bitcoin is something very unique and something very different and it doesn't correlate with stocks. It's not a company, it doesn't have financials, you know, there's there's not, you know, global instability politics with Bitcoin. You know, this is Bitcoin. It's it's its own thing. However, like every other market, it tends to have similarities with traditional stock markets. So let's go ahead and talk about a history lesson in the, the, the stock market that actually happened not too long ago. It happened back in 2015. It was something that I traded through, uh, not on the specific exchange, but I was trading at the time in stocks. And this is the run-up and the turbulence of the Shanghai Composite and other Chinese exchanges back during the summer of 2015. So this is something I always like to refer people to because not only was it one of my most interesting times of trading outside of what I've been trading with Bitcoin, um, but this was a very interesting market phenomena, and it correlates a lot back to the dot-com bubble, which we'll take a look at as well in regards to uh, the U.S. exchanges. But the Shanghai Composite is probably the best um, example of this because it was directly caused by what's happening in Bitcoin right now and what we're seeing with the kind of exponential exuberance and getting into something um, on little, little volume at these highs. So let's go ahead and talk about this. The Shanghai Composite is a it's a... It's a composite of stocks, much like you have, uh, at the end of the day, you have the S&P 500, you have the NASDAQ, you have you know, the Dow Jones, the big indicators here in the, Uni the United States, as well as the Russell 2000, you might have heard of that as well. And it's a collection of stocks and everything um, bundled into an index. It's a measurement of the market and performance in the market. So we can see here that the Shanghai Composite back in May of 2014 had an absolute rally within a short period of time, and in fact, really just a year, more than doubled uh, going towards uh, May of 2015. And a lot of people would ask, you know, generally, Nick, how did that happen? And also, how did it get all the way up here? Well, the reason this happened was because of two different types of investors. And I'm not talking about uh, buyers and sellers. I'm talking about retail investors and institutional investors. Now, at the end of the day, you hear me probably talk a lot about institutional investors. And t institutional investors in very simple terms are the big dogs, they're the big players. They're either people who have been mining Bitcoin for a long time, so they have a ton of it in reserve, they're holding on to it, and they can really sell it at any moment they want. Um, or you have long-term investors who bought into Bitcoin or or even people who bought in recently but bought huge stakes in it back when maybe it was at 6000 or 7000 or even before that. So you have these big players who have tons of money 
to easily move markets. And then you have the little guys, the retail investors, people like you and I who, who don't have hundreds of millions of dollars. Yes, I know, I'm not living in Lambo land yet, but <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, there's, there's people like you and I, the mass majority of traders and investors who have a very small amount of money, who can't move markets to any serious degree. We just simply buy, and in most cases, we're long-term investors. We hope for the best, and you know, we believe in something long-term. So this is exactly, not institutional investors, retail investors was exactly what caused this run-up in the Shanghai Composite here during the year of 2015. And it's the reason markets fell down so fast afterwards. And it would have fell faster if the government would have, would have stepped in and would, uh, would have not provided uh, this supply that it did. And I highly recommend you look past just this chart and go read about this topic for yourself. But what happened on this run-up here you can see the exponential, almost exponential or parabolic price action where things were just practically going straight up for weeks on end was because there was retail investors getting involved. And how do retail investors move markets like this? I thought it was institutions that made these huge run-ups. Well, it's not to say that institutions weren't buying in, and it's not to say that they didn't help play a role in it, but the reason retail investors can move price up very quick is because we're playing with very thin capital. When you have uh, retail investors stepping in, and in the case of China here, China has a huge culture of uh, gambling and also investing in things that are made in China. There's a very big pride factor, much like how in the United States, we like made in America. It's a very big thing. Well, in China, they were there was this whole phenomena outside of just going into the casinos and gambling, uh, which is, again, like I said, a part of China, um, Chinese culture. But you also have this, you had this huge revolution where there was all these individuals, these retail investors getting access to trading. Technology has made it where we can trade now more than ever. And um, no matter what economic background you come from, if you have a little bit of capital, open up a brokerage account, you can invest in the market. And a lot of people were going out and instead of reading financial reports on the companies they're investing in, seeing if the price was overextended or if the fundamentals in general were good, if they had a good you know, team or you know, sense of leadership at the company, those things didn't matter. They just simply bought in because they believed in it. Again, believing in something, not understanding it, not con conceptually having a feasible understanding of something. They just simply kind of bought in because it was the thing to do at the time. It was culturally trending. It's something that they felt good about, you know, buying into something. And they saw a large potential in doing so. Well, because of that, retail investors are investing with very little capital. But what they'll do is they'll pay the ask of the uh, the two different sizes. Though there's a bid and an ask. Okay, a bid is uh, a limit order, and then you have the ask, which is looking to uh, have a sell limit as well on the sell side. So. It's what a bid is what the buyer's asking for, and the ask is what the seller's asking for. Well, what the retail investor would do is they'd just eat up those ask orders. They'll just keep buying into it because you have a lot of retail investors, so the capital does flow into a decent degree. And then along with that, you have people who are willing to pay whatever price. They don't care about paying an extra 50 cents on a given stock. They're just getting into it because they believe in it, and they think it's going to go double the price action. And because of that, because of such retail exuberance and lack of fundamentals, you have speculation. You have a bubble, okay? If not a bubble, you have an exuberant run-up. And that's exactly what happened here. There was a bubble in the market. It was retail investors buying in, getting too exuberant, not caring about fundamentals, and many of them got burnt. They didn't know what they were buying into. They just simply were participating. So this is a perfect example of when you have retail investors making up the mass majority of increasing volume in markets um, participating in something. And it can lead to quite strong pullbacks in markets as well. Now, what does this have to do with Bitcoin? What does this have to do with what we're talking about here? The reason why this is very important is because when you get to these peaks, when you get to very high levels, I'm not saying Bitcoin's in a bubble, and I'm not saying that, you know, that, um, I'm not trying to cause fun in any sense that it's going to continue to pull back, but don't be surprised when you see these kinds of drops because right now, if you take a look here, you can look at the order book on any exchange. What's great is it's open to us. There really isn't much buy orders here. For the next few hundred dollars, if a large scale investor, even someone who has 500 Bitcoin, let's you know, let's keep it at a relatively reasonable level. Let's not say 10K or talk like Satoshi Nakamoto is going to come selling in. 
let's just say that you know someone who bought into Bitcoin very early on and has 500 Bitcoin came in and sold just like that. They wanted to clear it out and they're gonna fill through all these buy orders here. Well, they could drop Bitcoin within a matter of minutes, hundreds of dollars down. Literally, within a minute, they could do it. They could fill in the orders, or they could be a little patient and do it in chunks and stuff and wait for bid orders to come in and fill it at maybe a higher price. Either way, they can move markets very quick. And that's exactly what we saw over here. You probably can't see it. These are the volume candles down here, these very kind of thin, uh, almost transparent candles on GDAX. But you can see the number up here in the top right we had over almost 1,700 Bitcoin alone on GDAX sell at that given point. And that's not the only exchange where you saw that kind of sell order. On Bitfinex, we saw much like what we saw over here, where we had within a 30 minute period, $11,000 in volume. And I'll actually get down to the five minute here so you can see the actual moment it happened. 4,000 Bitcoin in volume. That's a lot of money. And because there wasn't those buy walls to support it, Look at the kind of price range that it was able to drop because it was going down to find bid orders that would fill their Bitcoin position that they're trying to sell. And this is what happens when you're at all time highs. Institutions aren't buying, retail investors are buying. And I'm not saying this is a cause for concern or cause for panic or that the market's done for. I'm just saying this is why you have these very big jumps in price. So again, I'm here today just simply to teach you all about this, take a little bit of a market lesson, and just like that you can see as well, again, how we just saw a huge uh, little dip right there and a price back up. Uh, you have these very radical price swings <laughs> coming in from retail investors being the only people really buying in here. They don't have the sufficient capital on mass to hold these levels because they aren't providing protective buy walls here to stabilize the price action. And when you don't have that, and when you have big sell orders coming in, markets tend to move down. They tend to have very radical price swings and have excessive volatility, okay? So for those of you out there, I'm gonna need you in the comments section. A too long, did not watch summary. For those, are out, those out there who don't have the time to watch this whole video of me rambling and get the whole history lesson. Well, for, first and foremost, I recommend you go check out the history of the Shanghai Composite and you know learn about that. It was very interesting. I had a great time researching into it and experiencing it as a trader. Um, but a too long, did not watch summary. So you either have to learn to step away from the computer and not look at the charts, or you have to be willing to make a position that makes you more comfortable. And if that means selling cryptocurrencies, if that means you know, doing whatever, you have to make that decision for yourself. And I think at the end of the day, we're all rational people. If you sit back, cut out the emotion, and think strategically, you can make that decision for yourself. All right, so just a little history lesson I thought about teaching. Uh, I, I don't know if I kind of uh, exaggerate here. I'm trying to focus on uh, making a video on Cardano and making some content for the channel outside of Bitcoin, but I understand it's in the headlines right now. Everybody's worried about it, and I thought it might come in and give you a little bit of a history lesson to maybe calm you down and explain some of this kind of stuff, all right? Anyways, everyone, that's it for the video. Thank you all so much for watching. If you all have any comments, questions, or concerns, please feel free to leave it down in the comments down below, and I'll try to get to it as soon as possible. All right, everyone, take care. Have a great day, and I'll see you all very soon. Take care.